What is the gospel? They say it's good news. But why? It seems as though it is simply a list of do's and don'ts, and we keep beating ourselves up for not being able to obey them all. No, the gospel can't be law. The gospel has to do with death, but the death of sin, so that we can truly live. The gospel isn't a one-time thing. It is a journey, a journey through every area of life, a journey through our ups and downs, a journey through trials and triumphs, a journey to the Father's kingdom, a journey that needs to be rediscovered. If you would, join with me in prayer. Father God, we humbly come before your throne, seeking your loving embrace, seeking your wisdom, seeking your heart. God, we ask this morning that you would do in our hearts what only you could do. Show us how you want to change us and give us the strength to accomplish your purpose this morning. We love you, it's in your name we pray, amen. Uh, we're continuing our series, Rediscovering the Gospel, and how many of you have been enjoying it so far? You guys learning, you're growing, it's been an amazing series, and we're excited that we've been able to do this. And so I wanna share with you, some of you might know how Kelly and I got together, and how we, and some of you might not know some of those stories, and so I just wanna kinda give you a little bit of of how we met and how our relationship progressed. I was teaching at a Christian school out in Cooper City, and I remember I taught there one year, and then this next year, I saw that there was a new first grade teacher. And I remember seeing this lady in the halls, and I was like, who is this person walking by? I was like, oh, well, I don't know who it is. Well, then there was this one day when I had my first encounter with Kelly. And I was sitting there, we had, we had to go to this meeting in the morning, and it was like really super early, and somehow I showed up late at the same time that she showed up late. I wasn't stalking her, if that's what you think. I wasn't timing this out. Just going to throw that out there. We just happened to get there at the same time. And so when we get there, the only place to sit was in the back of the room. And I sat down in one chair, and she sat down in the other chair, and then the guy was like, blah, 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 blah. And that's all I heard, literally, because it was like 8 a.m. And so he did all that. And then all of a sudden he goes, okay, we want you to turn to somebody next to you. And we want you to just have a time of prayer. Well, immediately, from the front of the room, it was like, boom, 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 boom. Everybody found somebody. And I'm watching. It was like, what is happening? And then I look, and she's looking at me like, she doesn't even know who I am. I look at her, I'm like, well, I guess we'll pray together and so our first conversation was prayer and so we get done we pray we're like well this is kind and to me I'm like this is kind of awkward because I don't really know her like what can I pray for you about and she's like oh pray for my shoes that I'll get a lot of them no I'm just kidding she didn't say that. she didn't say that at all she didn't say I'm sorry I'm sorry too far right too far no, but I don't remember what it was, but I remember praying, and she's like, hey, you know, you're a good prayer and all that, and so then the rest of the day went on, and we had another encounter later in the day, which was way more awkward, and then I had to go and find her and apologize for it, but here's what happened. I remember thinking there about it, because something started inside. I remember I was teaching chapel for the Christian school, and we had a team. There was three of us that were meeting, and we would plan stuff for the students, and then I was sitting back thinking, who else can we add to our team? And I remember thinking, you know what, I had a conversation with this, la- this girl, I keep calling you lady like you're old, I'm sorry, this girl over here, and I, I was like, you know what, she's really cool, she's down to earth, you know, she loves God, so I asked my friend, what do you think about asking her? Now, of course, I wasn't the one, I said, hey, bro, would you mind asking her if she'd like to join the team? And so sure enough, he goes and talks to her, she says yes. And so she comes to the meeting, she hangs out, she starts to get involved as part of our our chapel planning team, and I begin to notice, man, this girl is really cool. Now at the time, I was also very single, and uh, I knew that I, I knew what I wanted to find in a wife. 
And so as I began to get to know her, I began to see, wait a minute, she's starting to check stuff off of my list. And then my mom is in my ear going, when are you going to ask her out? <laughs> and I'm like, mom, chill. I, not yet. The, when he, every time I talk to her, so are you going to ask her out yet? You're going to ask her, you're going to ask her? And I'm like, not yet. I'll get there. I'll do that when the time is right. And so as I began to get to know her, I remember this one time where everybody went out and for this meeting, they all had subs. And I was like, where's, where, I, I was hungry. I wanted to get some food. And the lady's like, well, and Kelly said, well, I didn't have your number, so I couldn't text you. And then I thought about it. I'm a genius. Guys, you can copy this, okay? I thought about it. I said, I know how to get her number now. This is super easy. I don't have to make it awkward. I said, you know what? Here, you know, can I get your number and you can have mine? That way, if you ever get food again, I'll be able to get something to eat too. When got her number without it being awkward, okay? Now, that, does, that gets besides the point that I did friend her on Facebook first, and she claims I was stalking her Facebook page. But regardless of that, but there was something inside of it. Here's what I want to get to as well. There was something, as I got to know Kelly, it finally got to the point that this, this love for her began to grow that it was, I began to realize that she is somebody that I would marry. And this love empowered me and gave me the power to ask her out on a date for the very first time. It took me 45 minutes to send the text, but I finally sent it. And it took her two hours to respond. And the whole time I'm sweating in a parking lot like, okay, okay, I just threw myself out there and she said no. She hates me, what's happening? Then she finally did. We went on our first date and that's a wrap, okay? We're married now. But here's the point I wanna make is this, is that when I began to experience and know her love, it empowered me to do things that I w didn't have the power to do. And I realized, and I told my mom, I said, I will ask her out when the time is right. And it got to the place in my heart and mind when I finally asked her to go on a date, that there was nothing else, I, I had to do this because of my love for her. I had to send that text and say, will you go to dinner with me because of the power that was within me? And this morning we're gonna look at something because if you look at all these novels and books, two thirds of the novels all talk about one thing, the love story. Doesn't matter what the story is about. I mean, a friend of ours was watching Titanic about a ship that goes, you know, and what did they put as the main story? Was the main story of the ship sinking? No, it was that guy and the girl, and he's on the front of the boat, woo like this. And then the ship, you know, it sinks. And we all love these love stories, and there's something about love, and there's something about the power of love, and when you see love, there's power. And some, yes, they use it for evil, but we teach kids love stories, right? We have Cinderella finds her prince, Snow White, the Prince Charming. Now this one is a little weird to me, like uh, uh, Beauty and the Beast. I'm not, I'm not really sure what we're teaching kids, like hey, if you can't find a good man, ladies, go date an animal. I don't know what we're really teaching them there, but she eventually finds her prince and the animal changes and everything goes on. But here's what I also know is that in our world though, when it comes to love, we can also see that something is broken with love, right? Because not everything ends with this perfect love that we so desire that each of us have in our hearts because ultimately, if we're all honest, we all want to be loved, want to be accepted for who we are despite the flaws and the faults that we have. But when we look at the world, we realize that love doesn't play out like it does in the movies necessarily. And that many times, there are people who face rejection, humiliation, and depression, and there's and sometimes in love, it kind of gets played out like this. You have that person that's super overly confident in their ability to get somebody to love them, and they're like, <laughs> hey, girl. That's right. Girl, let me tell you something. I catch a grenade for you. I throw my hand on a blade for you. Girl, I jump in front of a train for you. You know I would do anything for you. Oh, I would go through all this pain. I would take a bullet straight through my brain. Yes, I would die for you, baby. But you won't do the same. And that's for the love that many people feel. 
So they put themselves out there, and the person rejects them. And their humility. And it can come from a parent, it can come from coworkers, it can come from friends, it can come from people in the church. And many people fear, feel this rejection and that there's something broken about love in our world. You see, so many promises have been made in the name of love only to be broken. So many people have put themselves out there only to feel the humiliation. And then people sit back and they say, does someone love me? All of my faults? Can I truly experience a love that is pure? Is there a love that can radically and powerfully transform my life? This morning we'll examine today's text and see what Paul says about power and love and how it can radically transform each of our lives. This morning our text is going to be in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And before we, hop, before we dig in and read those verses, I want you to understand that we're hopping right into the middle of a letter. It's kind of like if I were to write a letter to Kelly and you guys just jumped in on the fourth paragraph, you would kind of see some things that were said and you're like, well, what is this really? So we kind of have to catch up a little bit. So I want to catch us up because what was said before will make what we read in just a moment make perfect sense. And so if I can, I'm going to take a moment just to explain to you. In chapter 1, Paul says, God has made known the mystery of his will through Jesus Christ. And here it is, as a plan for the fullness of of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and on earth. So what Paul is saying is God's plan has been to unite heaven and earth together. That there is going to be unity between God and his creation. So unity is the first part of chapter one. Then in chapter two, we see that Paul tells the Ephesians, look, you guys were dead in your sins. There was nothing good in you, and God came, gave you his grace, Open your heart and your mind to know him, and now you're saved because of his grace. You can't take the credit. You can't boast about it. You can't work for it. It's God's grace alone. Then later in chapter 2, he tells him, look, you guys, the Gentiles, those who are not Jews, you were aliens to God. You were separated from God, but God brought you into his family along with the Jews. And so he says, God has taken you in, has broken down the racial barriers, has said Jew and Gentile are now part of one body. You are now my temple. We are now one and united in Christ. Then in chapter 3, he tells them, he says, look, he explains to the Ephesians, I was called by God to be a minister of the mystery that was hidden for so long. And what was that mystery that was hidden for so long? Here it is. Paul says it this way, that Gentiles are heirs and members of the same family of God as the Jews and have obtained all the promises in Christ Jesus. So here's what Paul is saying. God is uniting heaven and earth, uniting people from all nations, all tribes, all tongues into one glorious body. And then in Ephesians 3.10, Paul says, says, here's why. Here's why God has united them. He says it this way. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That the church, the purpose of the church is to demonstrate to the world, to heaven, this oneness that can be found in Christ and Christ alone. That there are people who love God, who love each other, regardless of where they're from or their backgrounds, and it will be a display to the whole world to say, there is an amazing God who can transform our lives so that people from all nations and races would treat each other and love their neighbor as themselves. Purpose of the church. And Paul says, okay, here we are. We show up to verse 14, I and mean, then verse 13 of chapter three, and Paul says this. Don't worry about me suffering because I'm a minister to this mystery. And this mystery is moving, it's transforming lives. So don't worry that I'm suffering. Don't worry, don't lose hope because I'm doing what God wants me to do. And then in turn, he does something for the Ephesians that is remarkable. He desires for the church to live in unity, 
and fulfill the purpose that God has for it. But he realizes something. He realizes something that he can't make them do it. He can desire it. He can want it. But then Paul does something that is powerful. And as I step back and I study this, it has radically changed me. Because Paul knew to be united, to fulfill God's purpose in your life and as the church, he did the one thing that would make the change possible. He did this. Paul's in prison when he writes this letter. And he's telling them, there is so much beauty in God. You are to be united in God. You are to display it to the world. And he does one thing. The only thing he could do is it says he prays. And I imagine Paul in prison, beaten, bruised, his love for the people, and in the midst of chains and bondage, he cries out to God, knowing this is the only thing that will change those Ephesians' hearts and minds. I want you to look with me at what he prays. He says this, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length, and height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. First thing you put in, I put in your notes is this, is how to pray. And then Paul, right underneath that, you can write down humbly. Humbly. He says in verse 14, at the very beginning, for this reason I bow my knees. Paul understood that he could not, it was not up to him to write eloquently. It did not depend on him to speak so that everybody had a great time and it was fun. He, did not, he knew it did not depend on him. He could give as many hugs to people as possible. He could be around them as much as possible. He could give them his friendship. But Paul knew that none of those things could do in their heart and life what needed to be done. That no matter how much he loved them and desired them, he could not change their hearts. That power belongs to God and God alone. So Paul says, look, I'm going to humble myself before God. I'm going to fall on my knees and recognize that for this work to be done, for hearts to be changed, for people to be set on fire to follow God, I have to give it up and say, it is not within me to make this change. God, it is all about You. You see, what Paul teaches us is in our attitude of prayer that we need to be humble. Because I know in my life, as I look at mine, I've had many chances where I've been struggling with things in my life, that there are areas where God has to challenge me, and I've done it in my own strength and said, well, you know what, I don't need to pray about that. I'll just make sure that I read, you know, my Bible every day, And then when I'm about to do something, I'll just make sure I choose not to. And you know what ends up happening? I end up doing that thing that I didn't want to do because I'm doing it in my own prideful. It's a good thing. 
I should try to control my anger, but when I'm doing it without God's strength, it's pride. It takes humility to, to, to sit down in our lives and say, God, I can't do this. God, I need you to do this in my life. God, it is not within me to give this up. Jesus, change me. Have mercy on me. It's humility. And Paul demonstrates that to us. In the very first part, he says, for this reason, because you're so important to God, because his purposes are so important for you to fulfill, I'm going to humble myself and call out to God and trust God, who is all-powerful, God Almighty, to do what I can't do. In our spiritual life, we have to be honest and recognize that we operate in God's strength, not our own. And for too many times in our lives, and for so many of us, we operate in our own strength, and then when it doesn't work out, who do we get mad at? God. God, you're not changing me. God, you know, I go to all these classes, and I still struggle with this. What are you doing up there? And God's telling us, you have not because you ask not. It takes humility to admit that we are not good on our own. Paul teaches us to be humble. Now, is he saying that we always have to get on our knees and pray? It's not what he means. It doesn't matter if you stand, you have your eyes open, you have them closed, you're bowing down, you're flat on your face. That's not, that's not the point. The point is your posture, your attitude to recognize that God is all powerful. We are not. God needs to do what we cannot do in our lives. Here's the next thing he teaches us. He says, draw near to our Father. And he says that intentionally. Draw near to our Father. And here's what he says. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. He's echoing the words of Jesus when his disciples say, Jesus, how do we pray? And Jesus models for him and says, our Father who art in heaven. And I know for me it's comforting to know that I have a Father in heaven who cares about my prayers. I have a Father in heaven who cares about what happens to me every moment of the day. We have a Father that promises to provide for us. We have a Father who promises to guide us. We have a Father who promises to love us unconditionally. We have a Father who will keep his word. He will keep every promise. We have a Father that has not planned evil against us. We have a Father who is desperate to be in a relationship with us. We have a Father who, catch this, chased you before you wanted him. We have a Father who is pursuing a relationship with you. And this same Father is the one that we have access to through prayer, where we can experience a love of a Father like we've never had before. And Paul says, when you pray, talk to your Father. See, I, my father was a great Christian man. And I knew if I needed anything, I could walk up to him and I could say, Dad, I need your help. And I could count on my dad to be there to help me. And yeah, there were times I were messed up, but I knew my dad loved me. Our God in heaven it's far greater than any good father that we have on this earth. That his love far outweighs any love that we could ever experience. And there's some deep love that we experience. And God loves us greater. And Paul says we need to pray to our father. But then he wants to tell us something else. He says, not only does he say pray to your father, but then he says this, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Why would Paul say that? Why would Paul put that in there like, did he like just sneak it in there just because he thought it would end his sentence well? 
Paul is very intentional. Because Paul wanted us to see that not only is our Father one who loves us and our Father, but he wants us to see that our God is all-powerful and that he can do and meet our greatest spiritual need. You might say, well, Brad, how does he show that from that sentence? Well, during the ancient times, if a king came in and took over a place, he would demonstrate his authority and his dominance by changing people's names. He would show, I am now in charge. I am now ruling over you. You might say, well, Brad, where do we see that? Well, God did that with Abraham. God had Abram, and he said, I'm going to change your name to Abraham. God saw Jacob and said, today, Jacob, I'm going to make you Israel, right? Then you look into the Old Testament in the book of Daniel. Daniel was taken over. The Jews were taken over by the Babylonians, and the king went up to Daniel and changed his name. Jesus came to one of his disciples and said, Simon, you will now be called Peter. Saul, who was persecuting the church, met Jesus, and Jesus said, I'm going to call you Paul. And so Paul wants us to understand that our God is the all-powerful, almighty king. In fact, there's no other king but God. There's no other gods but God. And this God is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's the greatest king, the greatest ruler. And catch this, we pray to him because he has the power to help us. Amen? Amen? He wants us to see that God is the only one strong enough to meet our greatest spiritual need. And he calls us to pray to our Father, to pray constantly. And we have access to this King who has all riches, all power, all glory. And here's what I want us to catch. Don't wait until things get bad. Don't wait until you need God to perform a miracle. Pray now, everything, every spiritual need, everything that you need in life, pray. Take advantage of a king and a father who loves you. Draw near to your father who loves and cares for you deeply and desires to work his power in your life. What to pray. Here's the first thing I put underneath pray, the next thing in your notes. Paul tells us to pray for strength for our souls. Strength for our souls says this in verse 16. Paul continues, he says, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Now, how many of you love a treadmill? No one on this side of the room. Let me... Is there really not a single hand? That's what I was hoping would happen. Right there, in the back, you, sir, are a brave man. Okay, treadmills, I think, are one of the worst things you could ever do, okay? I, people say, Brad, why don't you run track? Why don't you do that kind of stuff? Number one, I'm not gonna run unless there's a purpose. Like, I mean, yes, I could win a prize, but just to run around a track, like, that's not fun. Like, I don't mind running if I play in football, because I'm running to score a touchdown. Well, no, actually, I'm running just to play defense. Um, if I'm playing basketball, it's running. But a treadmill, you literally kill yourself and at the end of the day, you have gone nowhere, right? You're like, oh, oh. Then you can't breathe, your lungs, you have phlegm that comes out of all your places, and you're like, ah, ah. and you've gone exactly nowhere in your life. But here's what I want to say. The reason why I talk about that is that sometimes I think in our, our Christian walk, and I know I have been guilty of this, so don't say, oh, Brad's just calling this out of me. No, I've, I do, I've done this as well, okay? I have the tendency to do this because I'm a sinner just like all of us here. But here's what I think. We confuse activity with spirituality. Does that make sense? We confuse activity with spirituality. Where, this is what I mean. So uh, how are you doing in your walk? Well, I'm attending 15 life groups in the same week. Okay, um, but have you spent time with Jesus? Yeah, I'm attending 15 life groups, and I'm also serving in 20 ministries on Sunday at the same time. Okay, well, that's cool, but have you spent time with Jesus? Well, you know, I also go to church five times on Saturday and one time on Sunday. Yeah, I'm spending a lot of time with... Have you spent time with Jesus? What do you mean? Aren't those spending time with Jesus? Here's the point I want to make. We confuse activity with spirituality. 
You see, the activity's not the point. Well, I attended a life group today, and that's all I do. Okay, what do you do before the rest of the week? Well, do you spend time in prayer with God? I mean, spend time in prayer, not like bless his food to our body. Here's what Paul wants us to catch. Prayer is the fuel for our spiritual life not activity. We can get caught up in all the activity and spend zero time with God. Do activities have their place? Do activities have their purpose? Yes, but here's how. Your prayer life and how God fuels you in your prayer life and spending time with him leads to your activities. That as you spend time with God, man, God, I love you. God, you're changing me. God, it's your power at work in me. Man, I want to be around your body. I want to be around others. I'm going to join the life group because of your love for me, and I want to love your people, and I want to grow, and I want them to grow. And so as I spend time with you, God, now I'm going to come to these activities, and I'm going to volunteer at church, not because I think that gets me close to you, but because of my love for you and your love for me, now I'm going to serve and do what you've called me to do. And that leads to your activities. But your spiritual strength does not come from yourself. And there are too many dehydrated Christians. I don't even know what I just said. But it makes sense in my head. That we are spiritually exhausted because we're spiritually thirsty. And we need to spend time in prayer. In fact, we need to double it. We need to triple it. Everyone should be on the prayer team that meets on Wednesday nights. We spend more time on activities than we do in prayer, and then we get mad at God when he doesn't show up in our life and give us the strength to live for him. And God is saying, it's not my fault. I have all resources. I have all strength. I have all power. And you don't talk to me until you're in trouble. And then blame me for not working. Prayer is the fuel to your spiritual strength. There's nothing else that will cause you to grow other than you spending time with Jesus Christ. Activities are good. They help you get encouraged. They help push you to make sure that, but all those things are designed to get you to spend time with Jesus, to talk to him, to love him. Apostle Paul said it this way in 1 Timothy 4, 8, for while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. We do our spiritual training on our knees, folks. That's where we do our, physical, our spiritual training. And then he says this, he says that God will strengthen us according to his glorious riches. You might say, well, what does that mean? I, I, I saw a great illustration and here's what it says. There's two ways you can give. You can give out of your riches or you can give according to your riches. And let's say I walk up to somebody and I say, hey, uh, I have this great need in my life. It's going to cost, you know, X amount of dollars. And that person says, all right, I see your need. It's great. I'm going to give you 20 bucks. Like, oh, I mean, that's cool. That's something towards it. That's going to help a little bit, $20. That person gave out of his riches. But let's say, different person, come up, say, hey, here's my need. It's this amount of money to do it. That person takes out a check, writes the check for the full amount. That person has given according to the riches that they can afford to write that check to cover that need. Catch this. Here's what Paul's saying. That God can write the check for your greatest spiritual need. He doesn't give out of his riches. He gives according. And so no matter what that spiritual need is, it might be huge to you. You might think it's a big old mountain that you have in your life. And God says, I can write the check for your greatest spiritual need. That's what Paul says, that this is the strength that God provides for a life. Here's the next thing I put in my notes. Paul says, not only do we pray for strength, but we pray that Christ to dwell in us Verse 17 says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I know when I read this verse, I had a couple questions because I'm saying, okay, wait a minute. When God strengthens us in our inner being, our souls, who we are, 
then God is saying that Christ will then dwell in our hearts. Does that mean that God sends Jesus later after salvation? And so I had a couple questions, and no, it's not what it means. That Christ dwells in us at salvation. But here's what Paul means. That as you're strengthened in your inner being through God's spirit, that you become aware of Christ's presence in your life. That you become aware of his love. You become aware of his power in your life. You become aware, and here's what you do. You begin to say, I know that Christ lives in me, and I want to honor him with my life. And so Christ, I'm aware that you want to change me. Jesus, live through me. Jesus, fuel my life so that when people look at me, they don't see me, they see you. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Galatians 2.20. He says, uh, I just lost my verse. It is no longer, uh, for I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet it's not I, but Christ who lives in me. And Paul understood that for him to be aware of Jesus in his life meant that it was now Jesus living through him. Are you with me? Does that make sense? And so Christ dwelling in our heart is this awareness to live 100% for God. Pastor Jose and I were speaking this week and he told me a great, uh, he gave me a great explanation of this. He said he sees Christ dwelling in our hearts as the awareness that we surrender our whole lives to Christ not just some areas. He sees it as a total surrender to Christ as Lord of our life. When I was at my house, I live in my house, I was allowed living there in the house to go wherever I want in the house. I could go to all the rooms, go everywhere and all these things. I could have access to the house. But you ever been to those houses where you can't go in certain rooms? Where it's like all the furniture is set up, but you're not allowed to like walk. If you go in there, you have to levitate across the room. And it's kind of like we have this whole room set up, but you can't touch or use anything. Say so We have that, but here's what Paul, to dwell literally means that, that God is residing in us. And there's so many times in our life that we tell God that we treat God the same way. Like, God, you can come into my anger room, but you can't touch my lust room. Right? You can enter my bitterness room, but you can't touch my gossip room. I need that. You can enter my bad language room, but you can't touch my pride room. You can, you can enter my lack of faith room, but you can't enter, this is my time, God. I need my time for me. You can't touch that room. And here's what Pastor Jose is encouraging us and what Paul is telling us. Let Christ dwell in every room in your heart. Let everything go. Give Christ free reign to your life and your heart and watch his power at work within you. Here's the next thing I put in my notes. Foundation of love. Paul says that you being rooted and grounded in love need to have a foundation of love. You see, why should we have a foundation of love? Because love is powerful. Love inspires, love empowers, love gives hope, and especially the love that comes from God. 1 John 4, 16, the disciple John said this, So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Church, have you experienced the love of God? Have you felt the loving compassion of our Heavenly Father? Have you felt his peace in the midst of the worst storm you could ever imagine? Have you felt his love in your deepest valley? When you've experienced that, you know that that is what you cling to and hold on to when trouble and suffering and tribulation comes. Amen? And he tells us that we need to be rooted and grounded. And rooted, he's referring to a tree. And if you look at the trees, especially here in Florida at 12 p.m., the trees are like going back and forth because it's raining so bad. But the trees stand firm. They don't move. They don't waver. When something bad happens, they stand up. In the same way in our lives, God says, look, if you are rooted 
and your roots go deep into my love and you've experienced my love to the fullest, you will stand tall in the midst of the biggest storm in your life. You won't run and hide. You won't seek another God. You won't turn away from me. You will just sit back on your knees and say, God, I need you. That's what love does for you. He says not only be rooted but have a foundation. And Jesus alluded to this in a parable when he said, build your house on a rock, not on sand. So when the rains come or fall and the floods come up, your house stands tall. Paul knew that for us, if we find, find our greatest love in God, that we will never waver and look for anything else to replace God's love in our hearts. But I know many Christians that compromise, that they, they don't want to wait and seek the love of God. So here's what we do. A boyfriend, girlfriend, wife, husband is not your foundation, church. Social media acceptance is not your foundation. Sex is not your foundation. Career advancement is not your foundation. Popularity is not your foundation. Serving is not your foundation. Good works is not your foundation. Drugs, alcohol, addictions are not your foundation. The only foundation that holds you up is God's love. That's it. And I've seen too many people struggle because their foundation is something else and it causes them to get deeper and deeper into sin because they have found their foundation in other people and other things and not God. The people that stand tall, that can weather any storm, that have hope, and you look at them and say, how do you have so much faith? They know and experience God's love and you haven't. And when you experience it, you will never let go of it. You could say my whole world could crumble. You could take my house, my clothes, my dog, my cat, uh, but you could take all of that, but as long as I have God, I'm okay. Here's the next thing I put in your notes, and we'll move quickly. I know we're running up against time. Grasp the power and love of Christ. Grasp the power and love of Christ. Verse 18 and 19 say, say this. Paul says that they may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And in the ESV, it uses the word that you would comprehend, and it's unfortunate because it's kind of confusing. It doesn't really give the full explanation. The word for comprehend literally means to grasp, to hold of it. And the Apostle Paul uses the same word when he says in 1 Corinthians, hey, when you guys are running a race, run to win. Run to obtain the prize. And so what Paul is praying for the church in Ephesians and what we should pray for ourselves is that we would truly grasp Hold, obtain, attain the love and power of Jesus Christ. That we will actually receive and know the power and love of Jesus Christ. This is what Paul is praying for. Because Paul knew that once we grasped and obtained Jesus' love, nothing would shake us. See, remember, he's writing during a time when Christians were being persecuted when they were getting put to death. And he knew if you are enraptured by the love of Jesus Christ, they could take your life, but you would never deny your savior. They could persecute you, but you would praise your father. They could beat you, but you would cry out, God is great. They could try to snuff you out and say, and punch you and beat you, and you would still say, I love Jesus. Jesus loves me. That's when you know you've had the love of Christ in your life. Because if you are honest with yourself, I know in my life God has, I want you to think of your greatest mistake. Think of your greatest mistake. The one that you're ashamed of that you would never tell anybody else, it's only you and God that know that greatest mistake. Then I want you to think of the cross. Jesus' love is so great that your greatest mistake was nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ and put to death, and your faith in him took away all the pain, the shame, and the guilt, and you are forgiven and set free. That greatest mistake, he achieved victory over it in your life. Can you grasp the power and love of Christ? We are forgiven of all sins that's a huge love of God 
And he says the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, meaning God's love goes so far above and beyond. But what we do know, we can never fully know it, but what we do, it changes us. It radically changes us and compels us to love this God who has loved us so much. There's a story of a pastor who took his daughter to the beach then she came home, and as he was tucking her in at night, he noticed there was this jar of water sitting on her, her dresser, and he's like, what is that? Like, why do you have this weird water? And she goes, oh, I brought the ocean home with me. And for her, that was enough to hold her and to keep her. This was the ocean. This was it. Now, was that really the ocean? No. The pastor went on to say that you could get in a plane and you could drive over the ocean, and you could see, wow, look at how big it is. It's so wide. But you don't know all the depths. You only see a part. You could go to space, he said. You could have astronauts in space look at the world from a distance, but they still don't see and know the depths of that ocean. He said in the same way, that's how it is with God's love, that what we can't see and we grasp is enough to fuel us, but God's love is even greater than that. And that's the love he has for each and every single one of you in here this morning. You see, my love for Kelly, I could read books about Kelly, I could sing songs about Kelly, I could write poems about Kelly, I could watch videos about Kelly, I could, you know, see Snapchat videos of Kelly, and I could get an idea of, okay, I could love her. But you know what really makes a difference? Is when I experience her love in my life. When I hear her tell me, I love you. When I, hear, when I see her love me sacrificially and unconditionally, and I experience that, you know how powerful that is? Because what I had read about and what I had pictured, I experience, I know. And this is what Paul says that he wants us to pray, is that we would know and experience that love so it would change our lives radically. Here's the next thing I put in your notes why to pray, and we'll finish with these two thoughts. We will be filled with the fullness of God. It says in verse 19 that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I try to come up with the simplest way to explain this, and here I got it down to two words. The fullness of God means this, spiritual maturity. That the place where God wants to bring all of us is to a spiritual maturity so that all of us become the people that God has called all of us to be, right? I want you guys to be united. I want you to love one another so much that you will accomplish the purpose of the church, that the world will see how great I am because you demonstrate a love to each other that the world has never seen. And I don't think this message can come at a more timely time in America when there's so much racial tensions where God is calling his church to be the force to say we will demonstrate what it looks like to love people regardless of backgrounds, race, or wherever you're from, that we will stand out and love as God has loved us. But that takes becoming and having the fullness of God, which is spiritual maturity, and we need to pray that God would give us, that we would be full of the fullness of God. And here's the last thing we'll end with this, is that God's power in us is greater than any circumstance. And Pastor Mark did a great job last week of, of teaching on, on uh, whenever he spoke about Philippians, I don't know if it was last week, but the one week he spoke about Philippians, he did a great job telling us of our greatest need and how God can meet our greatest need. But I'm gonna reflect just a little bit on that verse. And, uh, and in verse 20 and 21 of Ephesians, here's what, what Paul says. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. When it mentions the word power here, that word for power literally means God's ability to get the job done. Simply what it means. So when it says that we would know the power, that's God's ability to accomplish his purpose in your life. And it's not a, oh, is God gonna accomplish it? Will God's power do it? No, God's power will get the job done. 
Because catch this, in Ephesians 2, you can look at it later, Paul talks about the power that God has. He says that it is the power that raised Jesus from the dead and seated him in the heavenly places at the right hand of God. Catch this, Paul is saying the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power that will accomplish his purpose in your life. That same power is at work in you. That same power is at work in me. And that's why Paul can say, so catch this, no matter what your need is, God can do far more exceedingly above and beyond what you could ask or what's the next word? Think. Basically God's saying, dream of something, I can top that. Get creative, come up with a big need, I can fulfill that. Well, you don't understand, God, like I can't really grow because of this. God says, I can do it. If I can raise Jesus from the dead, I can meet your greatest spiritual need. That that power is living in each of us. And Paul is saying, pray for that power. Pray that God would change us. Apostle Paul says it this way in Philippians 4, 12, and 13. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. How does Paul know how to act in any situation? Here it is, verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So no matter where you find yourself in life, it is Christ and Christ alone who will strengthen you to endure that situation. It is his power at work in your life. I said it this way, church, it is time for us to find our strength on our knees. It is time for us to put aside our foolish games. It is time for us to stop chasing idols. It is time for us to tap into God's power in our lives. It is time to humble ourselves and constantly pray to our Father. Let's become a church who becomes all that God has planned for us to be. Let's pray and dream and ask God to do far above what we could accomplish in our own strength. As we double our efforts in prayer, God's power and love will be unleashed in our lives to the glory of God.